Okay, um, this is Colin Parrish from Mental Health Practice and uh, I'm joined by uh, three people who are going to talk this morning about um, introducing change uh, into um, mental health practice, I suppose, and uh, mental health wards. And uh, I'd first like them to introduce themselves. So if you'd like to kick off, please, Marion. Thanks. Hi, I'm Marion Janner. I run the Star Wars Project uh, and I'm a service user. Hi, I'm Henry Stewart. I run a company called Happy and we do two things. We make learning about IT an enjoyable experience and help, com- help organisations create happy workplaces. Hello, I'm Julian Corner. I'm the Chief Executive of Lankelly Chase Foundation, which is a charitable trust which is focused on what we're calling severe and multiple disadvantage. So that's people who find themselves at the hardest end of society. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, so the, the reason we're here today is because Marion contacted me and said, um, we know what's right, we know what's the, the best thing to do in lots of situations, and, uh, and yet somehow people don't manage to do it. Um, perhaps on acute wards or on mental health wards generally. And um, we've had a prior conversation to say that things have improved, but um, today we want to talk about other ways that um, we can change things. So, first of all, what do you think are the problems or what are the reasons that hinder the introduction of positive change? Henry, I mean, I I actually think that sort of... um if we're taking for just as read, this is a time of enormous financial, um, well, beyond constraint. I mean, there's not enough money around. If we just sort of, because we could preface everything with that, so perhaps we just get that out of the way. But yeah. nevertheless, even in these circumstances, things could be much better. And I mean, the Francis report was very um, about mid staffs was very, very interesting about basically about sort of brutal management. And I think it's sort of timely. To, to look at management, senior management's role in enabling frontline staff to be effective, because I think that the emphasis is often on, you know, what are, what are nurses, what are the ward nurses doing wrong, what are the healthcare assistants mm. doing wrong, but actually it comes in the context about what support they're getting, mm. which is why I'm devoted to Henry and uh, <laughs> happy. Yeah, I mean, uh, what gets in the way is, is, is managers that micromanage and that get in the way of people using their their, their own intuition, their own ways of, ways of doing things. Um, if you talk to people uh, about what uh, they like and what they don't like, they don't like being micromanaged and told what to do. They like being given clear guidelines and given freedom and trust within that. Mm. And there is too much being told what to do from ma- management right up to government. You know, a typical government solution is to decide, you lot are no good, um, this is what you need to do, um, uh, these are the league tables set up to measure it, and then they complain that people don't embrace change when they approach it that way. Um, what's interesting about what Marion's done is complete, approach from a completely different way mm. and got a completely different reaction. Yeah, so, I mean, so Marion, your approach is definitely about a bottom-up approach. Well, yes, but it's not, it's not so much that there's a bottom-up, it's about trusting staff trusting, supporting and equipping staff, which is um, it, it's not only the happy way, but interestingly, there's a fantastic book called If Disney Ran Your Hospital, <laughs> and it always gets a laugh, mm-hmm. but actually it's a very, very important and astute book by somebody who's been a, a senior exec at both Disney and um, a large American hospital. And um, again, it's, it's all about um, th- that if you... Um, as Henry says, if you provide guidelines, you say what the expectations are, but then allow staff freedom within that, staff can flourish. And um, I mean, a simple example on a ward is that, um, that, that we, you know, we, we need group activities. And if, um, you know, the, the staff team agree that, um, you know, I don't know, each, um, each nurse, each healthcare assistant will run, for instance, one group a week, um, firstly, they need to, so there's a trust that they will be able to run it. They need to be supported. So they need to be trained in yeah. and supported in running groups. You know, OTs are very good and all that stuff and good at training um, and, and equipped. So, you know, if there's a group, they need whatever, you know, resources or information or newspapers or whatever to, to run the group. But actually, having set those guidelines, on the whole, it really doesn't matter that much to patients whether the group is a drumming group, a guitaring group, a poetry group. You know, if we're talking about more social and recreational sure, groups, sure. Um, and, and so that's where the sort of freedom comes, and 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 staff flourish. You know, they they are then able to run the groups. Um, you know, patients are grateful. Um, 
there's a more animated ward, um, that there's better relationships between patients, between patients and staff. And, um, and, and it comes through, yeah, trusting and equipping staff. It's really interesting you say about the, the Disney book because it just reminded me of the Olympics and travelling on the tube on the way to the Olympic Stadium and the uh, London Underground staff were transformed. Transformed. Absolutely transformed the way they interacted with the public. It's the only time a member of London Transport has ever asked me if I need help when I'm out with Buddy, who's got a support dog jacket on. Mm. I mean, I've been going out with her, you know, with that for sort of years and years. And it's the only time. I cried. I was so moved and surprised. It made me cry. But I'm um, sorry, Henry, you wanted to say something. Sorry. Uh, no, you're just moving me with your thing. Um, oh, um, no, I was going to say, the fundamental principle that we, certainly we follow is, is, is people work best when they feel good about themselves. Mm, absolutely. Now, I, I, I've never met somebody who disagrees with that. Mm. Um, but the next question that is, if that is true, what should the focus of management be? Yeah. And I, 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 t I address conferences and ask people. The, the, obviously, the answer is the focus of management should be on making people feel good. Mm. I, I, I address audiences and ask them, um, how many of you work for organisations where the focus of management is making your staff feel good? Mm. And I normally get one in a hundred. Yeah. It's very interesting that recently I got the chair of John Lewis to say, yes, that is the focus of our organisation. Yeah. And of nice. course, John, if you ask Famous anybody it, yeah. about what's your best experience of customer service, John Lewis is always one of those. Now, if our organisations, if our wards, if our hospitals actually had a real focus on making people feel good and giving them the trust that Marion talks about, then you get a transformation. But my, my guess is if you went to the local hospital and asked them what their manager's function was, they'd say it's A, to gather information, and B, to make decisions. <laughs> that would be very sad. Then. But don't you think that's... <laughs> well, I'm sorry, can I just see... Yeah, I think also to sort of prevent things going wrong. Yeah. And, and I think that mm. whole sort of terror of um, things going wrong and catastrophes paralyses wards. Mm. Um, I think it paralyses management and... and creates very, very um, narrow consideration of risk. You know, what, what, does, um, you know, what does risk consist of and how can we deal with it? And very, very short-termism. Because I think that's very interesting. It's probably very true <coughs> that most managers in the NHS see their role, or, or what the role they actually play is collecting information and taking decisions. Mm. But in a really effective organisation, the role of management is support, nurture, coach, challenge, mm. and enable their people to perform at their best. Um, and that's what great management is about. Sadly, throughout organisations, there, there's not much of it. Uh, there's a, a survey from CIPD which found, no, sorry, there's a survey from CMI which found that 48% of the population would take a pay cut to have a different manager. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, hands up. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, not think, me, because it's Ian. Yeah. No, <laughs> I think to go back to uh, your question about evidence-based practice, what we don't tend to ask ourselves is where that practice came from in the first place. Mm -hmm. And you, you end up with a set of evidence-based practices, almost like a wagging finger, um, accusing uh, the rest of, of the practice world of not being up to that particular standard. And what we don't tend to ask ourselves is, are we trying to reproduce that model of practice, which is one amongst many models that could have originated? Or are we trying to reproduce the conditions of success that gave rise to that, that idea in the first place? Right. Um, and, and those conditions of success, as Henry Marion said, tend to be around people feeling empowered to do things differently. And then the question is, um, how do you um, manage a workforce to enable people to do dif things differently and yet, and yet manage the kind of risks that uh, Marion alluded to? And, and so I think that you end up with these, these models that the rest of the workforce feel that they need um, to conform to or not conform mm. to, that's your evidence-based practice, um, which is absolutely against the grain of what gave rise to that, which is initiative and creativity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think but the, 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 the context that we have, which Marion's already mentioned um, with the Francis Review, is who are the only people who are in trouble over the Francis review. It's 40 nurses who are in front of the NNC. Mm. Really? And they were, they're were they the only people at the moment who seem to be in, um, the, in the firing Apart line. from on Twitter, where David Nicholson's head is <laughs> yes, called for set to roll. every minute. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but the truth is, there's, you know... That is outrageous. And you have, well, you have the Prime Minister saying, you know, we don't want scapegoats, which is what Francis said, 
but I think he's also said those 42 nurses should be struck off. You know, so the, I suppose the point I'm saying is, um, if you introduce innovation, there's a certain level of risk with it. Yeah. So the, how do we? How do you square that circle? How do you enable people to feel free enough to do the thing that's different that may end up being a fantastic new way of doing things that we could share all around the world? But are those 40 nurses on the line because they were innovating? Sorry, because they were innovating. Oh right. Well, um, I don't know. My guess is that they were providing. My guess is they were providing substandard care in mm. a system that only allowed them to provide substandard yeah, care. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, the, prob the problem with innovation and risk is that we only tend to talk about, about risk uh, when somebody does something differently from a standard set procedure. But what we don't tend to ask ourselves is what risks are inherent in that yeah. standard procedure in the first place. Mm. How much harm is that causing? Um, mm. And what, what are the costs of that? We, we focus all our attention on the potential harm, the risk and the costs of the deviation from the norm. So if we had a clearer understanding of what the costs of the norm are, um, that would help us to offset um, the, the risks of, of innovation. Yeah, because an example of that was the Baby P case in, yeah. in Harringay. The first reaction of the chair of the head of social services was, we followed all the procedures, we ticked all the boxes. Mm. You know, um, and if you look at what's happened in social services, it's actually been about removing judgment and making people follow procedures, whatever happens. Mm. Yes. Mm. And by removing judgment, you don't make it safer. Yeah. You actually make it riskier. Um, and to have more innovation in that system would probably make it... But safe and a lot better for And you take the heart out of the process. Yes, you? you do. Because all you're doing, people. Who wants aren't, to be a social worker ticking yeah. boxes? And, well, who would want to be a social worker given the, yeah. the kind of punishment that happens when things go wrong? Yeah. They inevitably will in a system that's struggling, I suppose. Well, and not just in a system that's struggling, but actually with people who, um, whose, I don't know, current state, um, either internally and or externally, um, is very, very risky. So, so like mine, you know, I've got borderline personality disorder, so, you know, high-risk behaviours and so on. Um, so the safest thing to do is simply to lock me up. I could have been locked up for the last 10 years, and that would have been safer, ostensibly, for mm. everyone, mm. although we still know there can be, you know, tragedies on wards. But actually, because my, you know, psychiatrist and mental health team and employers and, you know, mates and my friends like Henry have been able to cope with the risk um, I, I've been able to, um, well, I've been able to set up Star Wars, I've been able to live my life, um, and we've, between us, been able to sort of manage the risk. So it, it hasn't been about sort of clamping down, it's been, there has been about a certain amount of, well, it's been all about trust. Mm. You know, the, the professionals have had to trust me, I've had to trust them, I've, everyone's, you know, I've had to trust friends about being able to cope with my illness, and, um, yeah, I don't know if that's at all relevant. <laughs> I said. Well, no, but I think I think it's, risk is the word, isn't it? Risk is is the word that that, that we're coming back to, and um, I suppose the the people work in systems, and what you're saying is the system can be managed differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I suppose my my point is, how do you go from your perception and ideas and uh, training that you deliver, how do you go from that to actually introduce the kind of changes that you think need to happen? Well, I, I, well Star Wars is, is the perfect example here, that, it, that what Mary did was she went around looking at great, good practice and added ideas of her own, and so instead of saying you have to do this, 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 she said, here's 75 ideas, look through them, see if there's some you're doing already seeing if there's some, and you know, there were some that everybody was doing already mm -hmm. so they could feel quite good about themselves, and then there was, they could look through and see, oh, we could try that, we could try that, but it was absolutely about supporting people, not dictating to people. Yeah. And this brings on to appreciative inquiry, I don't know, Julian, whether you want to say something about that, um, but um, in, in terms of how, um, you know, some organisations are working with highly disadvantaged people using an appreciative inquiry approach, because on if, if I kick off with our bit, appreciative inquiry um, is our, um, I don't know, it, it, it's our sort of um, mindset, it's our, mm. our... Method. It's our method, it's our mm. belief, mm. It's, mm. Be, and, and what it's, I mean, what it's about is about noticing and appreciating and um, validating and publicising mm. what is working well, because 
we all know what's not working, you know, what continue, you know, what, what's very, very difficult with mental health wards and what goes wrong and so on. Um, and, that, and, you know, and report after report, you know, for decades has just focused on the same things and it, and it hasn't made a difference. That approach has not made a difference. And actually, um, I mean, we might come on to some sort of details of sort of social marketing approaches. I don't think appreciative inquiry is particularly a social marketing thing. In fact, I think it's more originated as a management tool. Yeah, yeah. But, but just it's, it's just sort of, um, it, it, it's about sort of, I mean, it's very, very parallel with the recovery approach in terms of about, being, about hope and optimism and sort of positivity, which isn't denying that things are going wrong, but it's actually a way of trying to prevent those things happening in the future by focusing on really strong practice. And there is masses and masses of strong practice and um, broken record but actually Wardipedia has over a thousand examples of great practice on wards and I, I cannot I actually can't tolerate people dissing wards across the board I mean, there's still some very very weak wards but actually on the whole inpatient care has improved phenomenally over the last five years and it needs to be recognized and it needs to be recognized because um currently because the staff deserve it but actually patients also deserve it i if i'm sort of anticipating another hospital stay i'd much rather anticipate it in a realistic balanced way which is that it's not all sort of crap and doom and whatever and actually there are some really marvelous staff doing incredibly innovative creative therapeutic work so the um the methodology of, of an emergent methodology of using appreciative inquiry for highly disadvantaged marginalized people is um ostensibly to try and acknowledge that um those people are the same as everybody else, mm. have the same um, ambitions, hopes, fears, uh, motivations as everybody. Um, and if you try and get to who that person actually is, rather than position them in, in relation to a service as a client or customer or patient or whatever, you get a much more rounded understanding of who they are as an asset to their community, to their mm. family, mm. to their, their friendship group and so forth. And the position of, uh, and their own sense of agency in terms of what they can do with their lives. And so, one of the things that we see time and again is that if you feel that you are being viewed as an episode mm. in a in a in a systems mm. um, uh, engagement with you, um, then it's a highly depersonalizing thing. But you. You know, the system gets the behaviours that it incentivises, and if you're incentivised to engage yeah. with the system in a certain way, yeah. you will do. Um, and it goes back to your point about risk, is that um, we have risk, risk management techniques that privilege certain things about people uh, and focus wholly on them. Um, if you start to get to, well, who, is this, who actually is this person? what's going on in their lives, what do they actually want for themselves, rather than how can I manage them as a, as a kind of unit of risk. The risk levels go down dramatically mm -hmm. because what is happening is being generated by a set of, of motivations in that person which go far beyond um, how do I relate myself to, to this system and how do I get out of this system what I need from it. It, it becomes about that person fulfilling who they are and the life that they want to live, um, not that person saying, um, um, well, here I am in engaging with this service again, how am I going to manage that relationship? Mm. So, I mean, it sounds like it's the kind of personalisation model that, that occurs in learning disability um, areas, I guess, where in, le in learning disability nursing, um, it's, all, it's, all about the, it's all about being person-centred and trying to build a package of care around that person. But I think it goes beyond um, person-centred because that can, that can quickly resolve itself into an administrative and management tool for packaging resources, okay. uh, existing services yeah. around the person. This is about bringing the whole um, new dimension, um, which is the person themselves, uh, to the picture. So a lot of this, especially in, in very marginalised communities and communities where people come from different cultural backgrounds, is about storytelling and narrative and about people understanding themselves in terms of the history, the story of their community, where they come from, where they, you know, where they fit in, where, where their culture is interesting to other cultures. Mm -hmm. It's about creating a greater sense of belonging and ownership 
um, within the within the life that you're leading. And the, and the danger is that you can end up with this binary relationship with a service which doesn't help you to work out how to live the rest of your life. Uh, and it presumably draws you away from all the, the culture that, with it, that you live in because suddenly you might end up in an acute ward where there's a kind of fracture. Mm. Well, exactly. Or, or it doesn't help you to... You, you may feel alienated within your own cultural environment because you know, you've got a set of experiences that you're not seeing mirrored outside of yourself. But mm. actually, when you inquire into that, you discover that there's all sorts of common experiences between you, yourself and your, and your neighbours in, or in people in, in different cultural groups that is actually an asset and a potential you know, a resource for yourself. I suppose I'm, what I'm struggling with is thinking that sounds fantastic because it, it, it puts the per, it puts the the whole person and their life central to 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 the the endeavour of helping mm-hmm. people I suppose mm-hmm. but yeah. but how do you horrible word how do you operationalise that how do you make that a reality for people now or next year? Well, I mean, it's, it's a sort of a very sort of huge. <laughs> Obviously, a very, very sort of huge question. Um, uh, I mean, we could bring it just straight back to um, to the evidence base and to social marketing. Well, in, in my terms, sort of social marketing practices. But actually, perhaps rather than me butting in with social marketing, I mean, but that, having identified that, I mean, um, as, as a priority for Lang Kelly Chase, I mean, that's where your theory of change yeah. fits in. I mean, quite a, you know. Well. Uh, the issue for us is, I think this is this is a this is this is a huge challenge, and you're you're at the, you're at the nub of it. It's no, it, it's one thing to identify what good looks like. It's quite another thing to um, to to know how to get there, to um, to feel an inclination to get there. Oh. You know, it, it has to speak to um, a problem that you you already know that you want to solve. So um, there is something about um, the system wanting to change itself. Mm. Um, but I think the we we end up with good practice being utter being compartmentalised or, or even commodified as something that can be purchased by a system which itself remains unchanged and unmodified. Mm-hmm. And what we don't tend to do is reverse that and say, well, what is this example? This great you know we we feel ex- inspired by this really great example of what someone's doing here. What are the implications? of that for the way that we're all working, for, the, for what the system is trying to mm. achieve. Because if, I, if I'm inspired by that, it's surely not just because that is an interesting project that got delivered. It's telling us something about the fundamental values of how we engage with people um, and, you know, and, and, and actually what works in terms of helping people to um, address and overcome uh, issues in, in their lives. And, and so... What we are trying to do at, at Lang Kelly Chase is to is is somehow to to bottle the the learning uh, from the from the practice and then think through how that would apply to the wider cultural change that we need in the system, rather than what I think has been a, a paradigm up until now, which is to um, to to get as much evidence as possible behind a piece of practice and then try and flog it around the system. There is no money now to pay for these ideas mm. which people are trying to, to flog. So we have to look at what are the fundamental implications of these ideas for how we're all working on a daily basis and relating to each other. So it sounds like, Julian, you've got the thing in the bottle. <laughs> Marion, you know how to tell people about it. And Henry, you can help the people who oversee the system to get it out there. Is that, is that the kind of, that, is that where the three of you are coming from? Well, I, I, I help the people who run the system to get out of the way, so the frontline staff get Okay, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting, interesting approach, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, 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 I know that you mentioned, Marion, when we spoke before, about this notion of frugal innovation. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean, and how, how could that perhaps help a, a system that doesn't have any money left? Right. I mean, I came across this um, as a sort of, you know, fairly structured um, concept. Um, it's um, an Indian concept called um, Jugad. Um, now, whenever I hear, I'm Jewish, so whenever I hear the word Jew, I go, oh, Jew, Jew, but actually it's not spelled like that. It's J-U-G-A-A-D, Jugad, nothing to do with um, 
the Jewish community at all. Um, <laughs> I don't think we're particularly renowned for frugal innovation, but anyway. Uh, oh, I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> A general, gross generalisation. Sorry. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> what it's about um, is... Um, and in fact, it was featured on, I think, BBC News yesterday that they um, showed some um, Indian farmers. Um, it, it's about um, local solutions to local problems that are delivered in a very, very cost-effective way, um, accessible to the bulk of local people. Um, um, yeah, so that's basically it, in a nutshell, but I would strongly recommend reading the book on it. Um, and there's some marvellous examples. Um, so one from India of, of frugal innovation is um, there was um, um, a local villager and he needed to do a certain sort of um, trip every day on his bicycle and the, and the, pot, and the road was very potholed. And so it, it made the journey very difficult. He managed to, very cheaply, possibly with no expense at all, span or whatever, adapt his push bike so that when he hit the potholes, it actually had, um, it's, Henry's a cyclist, you know, it's... It, so it's like suspension, he had it. Thank you, it was the suspension. The suspension was altered so that it gave a sort of turbo boost oh. to the bike. So actually, the potholes really became really an helpful. asset yes. and, and helped... <laughs> Um, I want one of those. It, <laughs> Sounds good. Well, and if they scale up enough, then they'll be, you know, selling them to, um, you know, um, Western firms and we'll all be able to sort of use them. Um, and, and, of course, frugal innovation is something that is practiced day in, day out on the wards. Um, um, and I've got loads and loads and loads of examples, many more on Wardopedia. Um, I mean, to give a teeny, teeny one, um, uh, um, paper plate frisbee, member of staff on a PQ, psychiatric intensive unit, uh, psychiatric intensive care unit, um, so people who are in, going through a very acute, very disturbed state, um, said they were, you know, sitting around, they were a bit bored, weren't quite sure what to do, um, they, weren't, they couldn't go out, I, I don't know why, if it was snowing, whatever, but, um, and so she just picked up a plate, a paper plate, and started a frisbee game. I mean, it's very, very simple, it costs nothing, and it's fun, and it's engaging, and it's surprising, and no it's... Yeah, very, very low risk. Risk. Yes. That's, very that's low right. Risk. That's right. I mean, that's a very. Yeah, I mean, there are millions of other examples. Uh, not millions, but sort of hundreds. But because basically, when you've got a ward, you've got the staff there. Even if you've got low staffing levels, I think leaving aside wards for elderly people, where, where mm. if it takes two people to take someone to a toilet, and you've only got four nurses in the ward, I mean, that is a very different situation. But on most wards, you know, there are. The staff are there, and actually, you know, what patients want above all else is staff to talk to us. And so the big challenge for us is what does it take, which isn't about money, but for staff to feel secure enough, motivated enough, supported enough mm. to engage with patients. Um, and um, and in some ways that, that's, the, that's what we care about more than anything else. You know, forget the frisbees and the abonites and the automated dispensing, park rangers visiting, whatever. What we really, what it all boils down to is how can we um, support staff to have warm, engaging therapeutic relationships with patients. And, and partly it's about management response, um, preferably, you know, mainly getting out of the way, as yeah, Henry says, but yeah. also being, um, a, but, but providing enough background, um, enough systematic support, so things like reflective practice groups, so that when staff start to engage with patients and we as patients start to respond and tell them the dark, dark stuff that's sort of inside, that the staff can cope with it, not just at that moment, mm. but that they feel like, you know, they feel able to turn up to the next shift having heard it. Yeah, I mean, that, that clinical supervision is obviously really, really an important an important aspect. Clinical supervision, but also reflective practice, but yeah. just slightly sort of different. Mm. Um, um, and I mean, one of Henry's big things is about celebrating mistakes. Now, we've mm. had many arguments about celebrating mistakes <laughs> over the past. I think this is rather problematic, the celebration of them. But clearly, again, with Francis, it's all about mistakes being, you know, staff feeling at yeah. least confident enough to be able to say, I did this wrong, someone else did this wrong, yeah. to expose the mistakes. So Henry, what do you mean by celebrating mistakes? It does, it does sound, it kind of sticks in the craw, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> Why would it stick in the craw? Well, it sounds, it sounds the, 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 like... The natural, thing, natural human thing to do. Well, I guess that's right. I mean, and that's very much an American thing, isn't it, as well? You know, that the, all the, in, in Britain, if your business fails, you're a failure. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, the question I often ask is, do we want mistakes? And actually, interestingly, most people say, yes, we do. Most people recognise. You know, if you give an example of a, of a workplace where they say, we, we were, made no mistakes in last year, what immediately comes to mind? I mean, it's not going to be a place full of innovation, is it? <laughs> it would be lots of ticking boxes, I guess. Exactly. Um, now, 
I know, you know, uh, I, 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 was at, I was at one event where somebody, I talked about this and somebody stood up and said, well, I'm from the NHS, and I thought they were about to talk about, well, mistakes could mean people die and whatever. Mm. But actually, they said, this could transform our culture. Because mm. uh, mm. yes, in the NHS, mistakes can mean people die, but mm. the fact you can't talk about it mm. doesn't make it less likely to happen again. And yet, it's, it, it, you know, one of my... When people, somebody comes to me and says, I made a terrible mistake, I, I often ask, oh, how many people died? But I do make sure nobody did before I ask that question. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. otherwise, it might not be known. Yeah. No. Um, so there's certain circumstances where no blame culture is crucial. Yeah. Whether you celebrate the mistake can depend a bit on, on, on what the actual consequences were. Um, but if, if people feel blamed, if you, it, it kills people's ability to try something new. Yes. But if you celebrate a mistake, what you're actually saying is you're, you're celebrating the fact that we've identified something that we can change. Is that right? Yeah, yeah you're creating the atmosphere where that becomes likely. You know, I mean, there's... Uh, and part of celebrating mistakes is, um, is recognising it happened. You can't celebrate a mistake that somebody denies happened. Mm. Um, so, it's, you know, you're, you're celebrating the fact... You know, one of, one of our trainers often tells the story of when he was three weeks in and he, of course, went completely wrong and he came in the office and said, um, you know, disaster, you know. And I was on the other side of the office, so I walked up to him and asked him what happened and he said, oh, I didn't prepare properly, I, I didn't react properly in the room, it just went terribly wrong. And I gave him a big hug and said, let's celebrate. And that gave him a message. That, that w one crucial thing was actually his reaction. Listen, remember what he said. Yeah. He didn't say, oh, there were pain in the neck, no yeah. delegates. I he said, I that. didn't prepare. No, I didn't do that. He accepted full yeah. responsibility, said, I got it wrong. Yeah. And, you know, that is, that's, that's what you're celebrating. You're celebrating. And then it becomes possible to look at what actually issues are, mm. rather than whose fault it is, mm. you know. Mm. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an adult relationship where, you know, it's no blame. You believe people are doing their best. Um, and people generally are. And I guess in a traditional, uh, the traditional management model, which might be more likely to see in the NHS, it's much more a parent-child model, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. You know, the, the manager tells you what to do. Yeah. If the, if, the, if the Prime Minister again says nurses have to talk to patients once an hour, <laughs> the poor patient gets <laughs> someone coming over, no matter what they're doing, talking to them once an hour. Yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> yeah. So it, it, is, it is about, it, it's absolutely, again, comes down to trusting people and believing in them. You know, if, if the member of staff is forever trying to think, what, would the, what does the manager want me to do next? That's not what you want. You want them to be thinking, what would the patient want me to do? What would I like to do? How do I help them? I think this goes back to um, the question of um, what are the costs and risks of an organisation that doesn't make mistakes? Yeah. Um, and do we ever try and quantify that? And the kind of flip side of this, um, there's a fantastic uh, book um, called Positive Deviance, um, yeah. and which takes as its inspiration uh, attempts to uh, to find solutions in the most intractable situations in international development, yeah. you know, around starvation and and uh, female genital mutilation mm. is, is another one. And 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 what that model does is 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 say, well, in any given situation, no matter how intractable the problem, there is probably somebody, a positive deviant, who is doing the, who has found the solution despite rather than because of the way that the system um, is working. And what we would then normally do with that, um, with that insight, with that, 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 that um, pinprick of, of, of good practice, is we would try and package it, turn it into a best practice box, and disseminate it through um, official networks mm. and say to people, this is how we would like you um, to behave. So you, you take um, a, a deviation from the norm, you approve it, and then you make it your official policy in that parent-child relationship that, that, that you, you said. So, um, and of course, back to my previous point, that is not how that deviation came about yeah. in the first place. Yeah. So you, you, you strip it of everything, of, of the value that it had. So what, they have for, so what the positive deviance methodology has done is it has tried to invert the system and give the power to the people who have um, positively deviated to say, well, okay, you're an inspiration, uh, you managed to do this uh, despite rather than because of your circumstances, so um, how did you do it? And um, you're probably more likely to be trusted by your peers than we people coming in, mm. you know, trying to provide solutions. 
And so you, and this links to another kind of thing that I've seen uh, emerging recently, which is communities of practice. So you try and create a safe environment where people are more likely to receive um, the learning from, from, from good practice rather than um, a, um, perceive it as a diktat or, uh, or um, you know, just a, uh, some official telling, telling them how to do their job. You, 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 you enable peer-to-peer, um, it, it can either be uh, service users or it can be staff, but it's a peer-to-peer methodology that enables people to create a safe environment, a facilitated, brokered environment where you can start to um, appreciate someone else's practice without putting up a defensive shutter and saying, you know, this threatens my own, my own uh, practice, my own professionalism. You try and create something where people uh, feel safe about receiving those, mm. uh, those messages and, and responding to, to, to their peers. But that requires an inversion of the power relationship. Yeah, and I guess that's, that was going to be my next question. I mean, it sounds, fanta- sounds fantastic and you, and you can kind of, it intuitively sounds like a, a way forward. How do you? Uh, I was going to use the word impose, but how do you? <laughs> how do you force people? <laughs> how do you get people to to be freed up to be able to, as a ward manager, to say, right, this is it, Marion. Okay, I've got to answer this. I've got to butt in now because this is this is core Star Wars stuff. And in terms of celebrating mistakes, big mistake right at the beginning when I was setting up Star Wars, and I didn't really know quite what I was doing. Um, I was sort of make it up slightly as I was sort of going along um, and my hunch, my sense was that what we needed to do was to have um, these 75 ideas which I sort of came up with have them um, enshrined as standards and for me if the, well it was then the healthcare commission if they had adopted those as standards I think I would have felt my job was done mm-hmm. it would have killed Star Wars mm-hmm. what, what we hear, the two things we hear most often about why people like Star Wars um, and there are something like 600 wards involved um, you know, who are members um, in the country, it's about 80% of the wards I think, they say um, firstly they want to, they're motivated to do it because they don't have to and we have to hold on to that. It's mm. all the stuff I think both Henry and Julian have been talking about, about it not being imposed from above. It actually is a trusting, emp- you know, empowering model. Um, and the other is it's practical and simple, which comes back, I suppose, to sort of, you know, Jugad innovation. Mm. Um, and um, luckily, I, um, I was sort of... Um, you know, um, turned away from. I was advised away from that sort of standards model. Um, I'm very sort of grateful for it because actually, you know, what um, I suppose both our behaviour, which is highly faulty. You know, I make mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. It's very nice having Henry as a mate because he <laughs> celebrates the lives, <laughs> weeping about them. He was going, "Hey, hey!" And really, last week on the phone, big fine aspect. Oh, and um. But, um, but it's human. It's very human. Um, and I think the fallibility, of, you know, and our fallibility is sort of human and the sort of slight wackiness, um, you know, and even the buddiness, you know, having buddy, you know, sort of everywhere. It's just, it is human to human. It, it sort of cuts a, across that. And it hasn't been, and because actually, because we are independently funded, we're funded by mainly by charitable foundations. So that gives us the autonomy to do our own thing in our own way. And again, that comes back to trust. And I have to say, and it might not end up in the article, but um, it is, I think, very interesting that the um, charitable foundations, um, including Comic Relief and Kelly Shea says, my favorite, have had to have a phenomenal amount of trust in, in myself and, and our trustees and the organisation because I am very, very high risk. You know, it's not the sort of... Nor- normally, the starting point for charitable foundations is you know, is stability, Mm. and and I exemplify (laughs) lack of stability, Mm. but actually, I don't know, for some reason, the the foundations have managed to sort of see that it's, that there is a risk, and it could go wrong, and and the money, you know, could go right, but actually, um, by trusting me, and everyone trusting each other, it's worked, so I think, was that long-winded, yes? Uh, Well, the job of foundations, um, if, if anything, is surely to underwrite risk, to help people do things that they wouldn't otherwise do, otherwise what's the point? Um, And I think translating that into your question about operationalising or or whatever, um, I think you you have to explicitly create a a space where people can 
um, be honest about how they're feeling about things, about um, their resistance to change, what motivates that, um, you know, the defences that they, they put up against, mm-hmm. things that we all do. And, to, and the most reassuring thing that you can hear is that somebody else is feeling the same way about something. Mm-hmm. And then you can start to, to, to resolve that. But the, you, you, we, need meth- we need means of, of keeping uncomfortable conversations going so that they don't get shut down um, and, and, um, and foreshortened. And um, so, so foundations, uh, charitable foundations are great because they have longevity, so they can keep an idea going, even when it's not looking terribly promising at times, so that it, um, it you know, because it may need 10, 15 years to come to fruition. But they're also I mean, autonomous. And, and they're autonomous, mm. yes. But what, I, what I'm trying to say about, about um, uh, the mental health system is that, that there needs to be, uh, within any practice, a, a space, a safe space, where people mm. can explore ideas um, and can connect with each other's insecurities and help each other through that. Um, and that is that doesn't necessarily have to kind of immediately transform everything that you're doing but you, um, and I think it's slight it's, it's probably slightly different from um, um, clinical supervision I, th- I think this is this is about um, exploring ideas that sit out outside of what you're currently doing um, and and as I say find a safe place to try and um, um, work through those with others um. I'm aware of the time, and uh, uh, it's been a fascinating conversation, really interesting, but I just want to give you each um, a chance to have a final word, really. If you think about our readers, the majority of our readers are um, nurses who are in clinical practice. They work, they work with patients, they work with service users in a variety of settings. And I wonder whether you have um, one message that you'd like to, to them to take away from hearing this. Julian? Gosh. Um... Uh, well, I think there. I suppose the one message that I would um, uh, want to get across is that practice gets, it's to my mind, um, practice um, gets for, um, forged and formed um, it, when dealing with difficult situations, not just by the needs presented. Um, in the client group, but also one's own anxieties and and defences, and those are entirely legitimate and human. And we have to um, uh, um, ha- we have to understand those as part of as part of the practice model. But this is not unique to inpatient care. This exists across all sorts of practice dealing with uh, uh, um, um, disadvantage uh, socially. So the bit that I would um, suggest is um, I'm a huge convert to communities of practice, which is getting out of your own practice silo and getting and, and connecting with how other people are dealing with entirely equivalent um, uh, situations in other parts, uh, other sectors. Mm. Yeah, that's really fa- that's really fascinating, mm. isn't it? Because in a way, nurses nurses' job is about you, the therapeutic use of self. Yeah. yeah. And what you're saying is that the the reality of being a human being in those situations can be very scary yes. and all those things going on and it's about dealing with that dealing with that first yes and 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 realizing that uh, i mean the problem with institutions is it then institutionalizes that particular reaction so what i'm what i'm saying is that part of the resource and resilience that can be had is to try and connect with equivalent experiences in other fields where people are working through different systems but it's experiencing similar kinds of things. Okay. Um, Henry, would you like to leave Marion to go last? Um, I think kind of believe in yourself. Um, Try things out. Look for good practice elsewhere. Um, You're doing a tough job. Mm. And make sure you get the support and appreciation. Hopefully you get it from your manager, but if not, get it from colleagues or from elsewhere. Get involved in community practice. Form form mutual support groups. And um, uh, look to try out new stuff. Okay, thank you. And Marion, I'll give you the last word. Okay, well, this is very, very annoying because now <laughs> I've had two very eloquent <laughs> statements. Actually, my little feeble notes here are still feeble, but um, I'll read them out anyway. Um, I mean, this is, I still believe in it, 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 it does, you know, echo, in some ways, yeah. tie together what, what, what you've both said. 
which is, I suppose, what I what would make the, I think what would make the most difference to wards is if staff um, recognised how expert and committed and appreciated they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, that sounds like a great place to stop. Uh, Julian Corner, Henry Stewart and Marion Jenner, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, Colin. You.